Thank you. Um, this, thank you. Um, this, this is my first uh, LCA as a Microsoft employee, um, which is not words I thought I would ever utter in my entire <laughs> life. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't spend too, too much longer talking about my, my new employer um, at, at, at this talk. I want to focus on the technical details, but if you, if you want to talk to me about it, I'm delighted to tell you what a great time I'm having working for Microsoft on Linux. Um, they pay me to work on whatever I want to, and right now, that's this. Um, so it, 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 it's a great job, and um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about how, how, how great a time I'm having. Um, but I want to talk about the page cache, and the, the important thing to know is that computing is all about caching, um, particularly these days. I, I, I just bought myself a new laptop, and so you, you, you can see here, you know, I, I went and did some calculations, you know, 10 billion instructions per second, which is great until you take a cache miss, at which point you realize that the, uh, the, 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 the RAM that's attached to it can only really deliver 530 million cache lines per second. So if you're missing, let's say, one cache line, Every ten instructions, all of a certain, all of a sudden, you're you're, you're only down. To, you know, you've, you've halved your CPU speed. Um, and of course, the, that, that that extends further. If 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 you're not just missing your DRAM, if you want to actually go to the media and get yourself a page from the uh, from, from from the hard drive, the SSD these days, um, well, that that SSD can only deliver eight hundred thousand four kilobyte pages per second which again is, is somewhat limiting this, this really fast CPU that you have, uh, which presumably you want to get your best possible use out of. And computing has always been about caching. I mean, so in 1975, a PD, which is the year before I was born, um, a PDP 11 slash 70 uh, could, could get 4,000 uh, four kilobyte pages per second off of its uh, RK05 drive. Oh, may, maybe you had two of those uh, washing machine sized drives attached to your uh, double cabinets of PDP 1170, but you know that's only 8,000 pages per second. Um, and 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 just to compare how things have gone over the last 40 or so years, uh, the media has gone up in speed by a factor of 200. Uh, DRAM has gone up by about, about a factor of 2,000, and the CPU has gone up by 25,000 times. So the problem has got worse since 1975, um, but at least the computers have got smaller because that's, that's a 13-inch laptop um, rather than being, as I said, a double-wide, full-height cabinet. Um, so even in the original days of Unix, back in 1975, I went and looked at 6th edition Unix just because I'm coming to LCA and I know you guys have a bit of an affinity with the, uh, the Lions uh, commentary on 6th edition Unix. Um, so I went back to the 6th edition and uh, yes, they had a buffer cache. And as you can see from the diagram, the, uh, the buffer cache sits between the file system and the device driver. And so if your DRAM happens to already have this page of RAM in it, you don't have, your file system doesn't need to go to the, to, to the media to, to get uh, the page that it's looking for. It can simply, uh, if, if, if you do a read in user space, it can satisfy that read without going all the way to the media because you've already got a copy of it in your DRAM. And that's great. Keith is pointing out that maybe it was core memory rather than DRAM. Thank you, Keith. I'm not quite as old as you. <laughs> but uh, back, in, back in December 1995, Linus introduced this, this, this new innovation. Not only did uh, Linux 1.3.50 have the buffer cache, which it had had essentially since its inception, but we also gained a page cache. Um, and the, the, the great innovation here is that it sits between the virtual file system layer and the file system itself. So if we, if we already have this page of this file in our page cache, we don't even need to trouble the file system to go off and look up where, where is this block on disk. We, we, we don't need to know where it is on disk because we already have a copy of it. So we can bypass the file system and just return the page to you, and just return the data that user space is asking for. Um, and that, 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 that's a fairly significant speed improvement. Now, the page cache as introduced in 1.3.50 is not quite the page cache that we have today. Um, 
Ingo Molnar. Um, so the, 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 the page cache and the buffer cache were separate, completely separate caches to begin with. Um, but in 1999, Ingo Molnar did the work to unify them, and now the buffer cache points into the page cache. So it, you, 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 the file system can still use the buffer cache interfaces that it always has, um, but that buffer cache ref references pages that are in the page cache instead. So you, you, you can't bypass the page cache and use just the buffer cache. The buffer cache will fill the page cache. So the, the, the two caches can't get out of sync. And that, that, that had been a problem when people were going sort of around the file system and looking at things on the raw disk, and, and then the file system thought it had a copy of it. Or, or it, it, was, it was a bit of a mess. But anyway, um, it, it, that's, that's all fixed up now, and uh, it, it, it works fairly well. So it turns out there's actually a lot of different stuff going on in the page cache. The page cache has a lot of functionality already, and it has had most of this functionality for a while. Uh, and there's some obvious things in there, right? You, you, can, you, you, do, you can do the obvious thing. You can find a page that has a given offset, a given index. Um, you can create, if, if, if you don't find it, you can create it. You can say, hey, just give me, give me that page. And you can, and you can read, you, you can say, um, get me that page and, by the way, fill it from disk as well. Or you can say, I've made this page dirty. Would, would you mind making it up to date on disk and, and let, let me know when you've done it? <clears throat> um, you can lock and unlock a page, and, and we'll get into the page locking protocol a little bit later in this talk. Um, you can remove a page from cache, explicitly remove a page from cache. Um, pages will age out of the cache naturally if, if you don't use them for a long time or pressure in the system gets to be larger, then we, we, we will evict pages from the cache. <clears throat> um, there's a port for waiting for page state to change. So you, you, you can say, let me know when this page is no longer being written back to disk. Or let me know when this page has become unlocked, when, when there's nobody else using it anymore. And this is to support things like um, truncate. If you, if, if, you, if you truncate a file, you have to wait for the pages which are, which are, past, you know, which are in the bit that you've chopped off. You want to wait for nobody to be doing anything with those pages before you get them out of the cache. Um, one of the fun things you can do is tag pages. So you can say, I've, I, I, I want to tag this page as being dirty. And then you can find all the pages with a given tag. So, give me a list of all the dirty pages, or give me a list of the next 10 dirty pages after this address. So when you want to um, go through and clean the cache, for example, somebody's given you a sync command and you want to synchronize those pages back to disk, um, you, you, can, you can just ask very quickly, which of these pages are dirty? And it's, it's got a very efficient data structure for finding the dirty ones and handing those back to you. You can also find a whole in the, uh, in the page, and that, 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 that's a hole in the page cache. And a hole is actually the term that's used in the source code. I don't think it's a very good one, because not, you're not finding a hole in the file. You're finding a missing page in the cache. You're, you're, you're saying, OK, so I've got, I've got this. It's used in the, um, in the fault handler. You, um, because we're, 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 we've, we've, we've taken a, uh, a page fault. So the kernel knows that user space has accessed this is, has tried to do a load from this page, which wasn't in cache. And rather than just going out and fetching this page, we want to know, are there any other pages, are there any other missing pages from the cache? Should we try and go and read a few more pages from disk? We're going to go, go and do a disk access, and we're kind of assuming this isn't an SSD. So, but if we're going to do a disk access, let's access a few more pages all at once and just be more efficient about batching, batching up cache misses and, and bring them in. So it has the ability to find where are the missing pages um, in, in the next little, little bit of the file, because we're going to assume the user space is walking through these pages in order, because that's, that's usually a pretty good guess. And you'll find out that uh, a, lot of this, uh, a lot of these things are heuristics. We are guessing about what user space is going to be doing. Um, because when we try and introduce interfaces which let user space tell us what it's doing, user space then promptly lies to us about what it's doing, and we were, be we're better off just guessing. 
sorry, I mean measuring and making good heuristics. <laughs> Um, and and, and what, one of the other nice things that the page cache will do for us is keep track of errors because we are very bad about handling errors in exactly the right way, in exactly the right place. And so we, we, we have this nice mechanism where you, can, where, where, where you can say to the page cache, I've had an error. And then hopefully somewhere else will, and, and then everywhere can check what has, has there been an error on this, on this mapping, on this, uh, in, in, in the file referenced by this page cache. By the way, we, we, we talk about the page cache as if there's only one. There's, there's, there's actually a completely independent page cache for each file. Each file because we, 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 in, we, um, we index into the page cache um, by, by file and then offset within the file. We don't, we don't have one per disk. We have one per object in a file system. So the page ca you, 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 don't have to, you don't have to acquire a lock in order to use the page cache. The page cache handles its own locking internally. And the, the, there's always a little bit of um, disagreement in Linux about whether people should be uh, handling their own locking or, or whether the API should be handling the locking for you. And the, the, this, this falls on the side where, no, we, we will handle our own locking. You, you, you can just use these interfaces uh, from basically anywhere. Um, so there, 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 there is a spin lock that's used, um, again, per file, um, per instance of the page cache. Um, but but that, that spin lock is only used uh, when we're changing what pages are in the page cache or changing things like which pages are dirty. When you're just doing lookup, we use the RCU mechanism, uh, read, copy, update. If you've never heard about it, I suggest going to Paul McKenney's talk, where he will, he will give you a wonderful introduction to what uh, read, copy, update is. And um, I will not, because I'm not as smart as he is. Uh, read, copy, update is basically a way where you try, where, where, where you avoid taking any locks and um, everything is handled in such a way that this doesn't cause any problems. There is, there is a complicated dance, which I'm not, I have a backup slide, which explains what the dance is. And if, if, if I have time at the end and there's interest, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that slide up. But um, when, when, once you've got a page that you've looked up, there, there is a, a lock bit in each page. Um, and we have this, this very custom, very exciting uh, mutex scheme to prevent other users from seeing that page while it's being read for the media. Um, because you don't, you don't want somebody else to uh, look at that page before it's become fully up to date from the media. Um, I mean, that, that, that would expose the previous contents of the page if it were, say, mapped into user space. You wouldn't want the user to be able to see the data that used to be in that page cache because that could be the contents of your password file, for example. So caching is the art of predicting the future. Um, and when, when the cache has got to the, to the size of almost all of the memory in your machine, as, as John demonstrated in the previous talk, uh, we, we have to decide which page are we going to get rid of from the cache. And so again, we have heuristics for that. We make the assumption, we, 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 we have measured, we have done extensive benchmarking that shows that pages which are only used once are more likely to not be used again. There's, there are an awful lot of workloads which read, scan their, entire, their way through gigabytes and gigabytes of information and then never look at it again. And that's okay. So we, we, we had to bring these pages in to look at them, but we don't want these pages to displace other pages which are going to be used again more frequently in the future. So we, we kind of want those pages to com the, the, those pages that we've read in and only used once, we want them to compete against each other to be thrown out. And we don't want to throw out pages which have been used more than once. So we, we, we make this, uh, this nice little distinction. So we keep two lists. We keep an active list and an inactive list. 
And pages can be promoted from the inactive list to the active list just by being used a second time. So if, 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 if we take a page fault on a page which was on the inactive list, we'll promote it to the active list where it competes against the other pages on the active list. And uh, the competition for pages on the active list is that uh, once you get to the bottom of it, you get dropped off onto the inactive list. Um, and if you're used again while you're on the active list, you'll be promoted back to the head of the active list. And so you'll, you, you, you will never reach the bottom, hopefully. Um, but the problem is that we, we, we make better decisions about which pages are, actu are actu actually active and inactive if the inactive list is longer than will fit in RAM. That, that, that is, if, if, if we keep all the pages in RAM which are inactive, we run out of RAM. So once we have to drop a page out of the inactive list and evict it out of RAM, we, 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 we install these shadow entries into the, 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 the page cache contains not just pages, but also um, what are called exceptional entries. In this case, the exceptional entry is being used for shadow entries. And the shadow entry is, is, is the same size as a pointer, but it's, it's not actually a pointer. It doesn't point to anything. It, it, it just contains a very tiny amount of information that says, this is where the page would have been on the inactive list if we had enough memory to keep the page in memory. And so when we, hit, when, when, when we take a page fault, when we look up in the page cache and, 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 and we hit one of these pages which should have been on the inactive list, we can, take a look at, we can take a look at the shadow entry and say, ah, well, this should have been on the inactive list, but we ran out of RAM. So what we'll do is we'll bring it back into memory again, because obviously it's been referenced, we have to bring it back into RAM again. But instead of putting it at the head of the inactive list, we'll put it at the head of the active list again. Because if we didn't have the memory pressure, we would have, or we would have still had it in RAM. So we made a bad decision by kicking it out of memory, because it, it turned out it did get used again. But we're not going to make the same bad mistake again. Uh, by putting it at the head of the inactive list, we're going to put it at the head of the active list. So it, it, it gets a little bit of a better chance of, of uh, hanging around until it's actually used again. Until it's used for a third time, right? Um, one of the problems that um, Johannes fixed recently was that uh, shadow entries um, were... It, it, it was possible to have a workload in which uh, the, 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 uh, the page cache ended up populated almost entirely by shadow entries. Um, because the, the sh while, while there was a hole in, in, the, uh, in the page cache to put these in, at some point you want to shrink the data structure that contains all of these uh, pointers. Um, and so what, 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 what he does is he keeps track of, of, of chunks of the, um, of, 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 of the data structure uh, underlying the page cache, which, um, which, which contains these shadow entries. And when we hit enough memory pressure that uh, we need to start freeing them up, he, 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 he has a completely separate uh, least recently used list for, 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 for those uh, portions of, of the data structure, and he'll start evicting those shadow entries. So, you know, it, it, we, we, we've, we've not only kicked these things off the inactive list, we've kicked these things all the way out, and uh, they will just, you know, they, they'll, they'll, they'll never, uh, if, we, if, we hit, if we fault on them again, we will never know that uh, they, they, sh they, they should have been on the inactive list. But that was, that was the price we had to pay in order to, to, um, to make the, uh, the to, 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 to avoid running out of RAM. One of the other enhancements that I've uh, recently been involved with is huge pages. Um, so I, I, I was in no way involved with the original transparent huge pages work. Uh, that was originally done by uh, Andreas Arcalenji for um, anonymous memory. And anonymous memory is the kind of memory that you get when you call malloc. It's not associated with any particular file. It's just 
or, or break for that matter, uh, the break system call. Um, it, it's, it's just memory that is private to you and uh, there, there's, there's no there's no sharing of it. It doesn't, it doesn't get involved in the page cache. It's just memory that exists and, and you get to use it. But when, when you have terabyte size files um, and you know, get, getting on I mean, giga, tens of gigabytes of RAM, it turns out you really want to use the huge TLB entries that the CPU has in order to map two megabyte chunks or one gigabyte chunks of the file at a time. It really cuts down on your overhead if you can do that. Um, so, um, my, my former colleague, uh, Kirill at Intel, has uh, got a, the first attempt merge to support um, huge pages in the page cache. And what he does is he simply adds 512 entries to the page cache. So, we, we, we have this data structure over in the uh, main memory management code, which represents a, a single two meg megabyte page. So, he's allocating the two megabyte page. But in the page cache, he's, he's then put in 512 copies of it. <laughs> so no matter where you look up within that page, you will, you will get the same entry. And where I came in was I said, look, that's, <laughs> that's silly. <laughs> um, there, there's a few problems with that, it turns out. Um, so I, I, I've spent a, last, a large chunk of the last year enhancing the radix tree so that we can put in one entry <laughs> And we call it an order nine entry because uh, two to the nine is 512. Um, so he, he and I have been working closely together on this. Um, even after I left Intel to join Microsoft, we kept working together because this is Linux and that's what you do. Um, so we, 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 we have some, so I have now got the patches in to enhance the Radix tree, and I think in the next release of Linux, we will have the patches that will add a single order nine entry to the page cache. And nobody's really going to, nobody who's using the page cache is going to notice the difference, but you know, there'll, there'll be slightly less memory used, everything will work slightly quicker, and things will be much better. So after I submitted this talk, someone in the audience, Dave, just so I say, eh, we don't need this. We don't need any of this. DAX doesn't have a page cache. Applications that want to use high ops are using direct I.O. because the page cache just introduces latency, memory use issues, and non-deterministic I.O. behavior. There's nothing like having your colleagues question your entire motivation. <laughs> so, are they going to drop my talk? Fortunately, I don't want to say Dave's alone in his opinions, but there are those who disagree with him. Other than me. So I, I, I thought it'd be instructive to go through why we might want to have a page cache, even for one of the things he suggested, which is uh, DAX. Now, I, I designed DAX originally. I, 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 I wrote that code, and I said, we don't need to use the page cache for this. And I was wrong. <laughs> That's okay. We're all wrong. Everybody's wrong. So this, this, this is how DAX currently works. It's, it's not quite how I originally did it. Um, other people have been tweaking it for the last year, and uh, I've, I've, I've been watching while I, I, I worked on the Radix tree, because the Radix tree was more important to get done first, because I'm going to start using the Radix tree um, in DAX. Um, so in users, the, the user calls read. The VFS calls the file system's VDITER method. The, the file system then calls into DAX and says, hey, th 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 this, this is how you get at blocks um, through the IOMAP ops interface. Um, do, do this read for me. And then DAX calls back to the file system, say, um, OK, so here, here's the file offset I've got. Can you translate that to a block number? And then it calls the block device that the file system is sitting on and says, um, I have this block. Please uh, map it into uh, the kernel's address space for me. And then it calls memcopy. It's, it's not called memcopy, but essentially it's, it's a mem it's, it is a memory copy of some slightly variant uh, uh, type. And then it tells the block device it's finished with that block, and it can unmap the address. OK. It's not awful. 
But this is how it ought to work. And this is, and, and this, I, I started working on some patches for this last LCA, and then I ran into some political problems, and then I got laid off, and I got distracted, and I didn't finish the patches, and now I have to redo them because everything has changed underneath me. That's fine. Simple matter of coding. So here's how I think it ought to be working. The first three steps are just the same. I don't, I don't change anything about how the file system is working. Um, well, I do, but that's uh, irrelevant. Um, so when, when it gets into DAX, what DAX should be doing at this point is saying to the page cache, what's the physical address for this offset in the file? And then it, doesn't call, it shouldn't be calling down to the device driver. Assuming the page cache has that, if, if the page cache doesn't have that information, then we need to go off and populate the page cache. But I haven't put that up here because I didn't really have space on this slide. Um, but assuming, in the common case, the, the page cache will already know from a previous call what the physical address of a, file, of a particular file offset is. And then we'll go and do the, uh, the, the, the then, then we can call some generic kernel code rather than device driver to say, here's the physical address. Can you give me a temporary virtual address for it, please, that I can access? And then DAX will call memcopy, just like it does now. And then it will unmap the virtual address again. You'll notice we haven't had to ask the file system about anything. Because the file system, because the file system has already done all the work in a previous call. We have cached that information. And so I just want to go back to Linus's um, statement here. Not having a page cache is really, really bad for performance and stability. You don't want your file system code to be in the critical path. It's a major disaster from a locking standpoint. He's so right. Because the, the, the locking that we're doing in the file systems for DAX has been disastrous. Um, we, we originally thought we could get away with some fairly simple locking, and then it became a little bit more complicated as we could discover an edge case. And then we discovered another edge case, and we discovered a third one, and it, it turned out to, and, and, and now the locking is really, really ugly, and I, I, I absolutely hate it, and I'm really sorry that I made this mistake of thinking we could bypass the page cache. It turns out that adding or, or, or reusing this layer of abstraction would have been the right thing to do, but now I have to fix it. So I've already talked about some of the, uh, the future enhancements that I want to make. I've, um, so the improved huge page support, that, that's coming very soon. Um, like I say, I, th I think that's going to be in the next release. Um, it's already sitting in uh, Andrew Morton's MM tree. Um, it's, it's looking promising. I've talked about already the uh, storing the PFNs. Uh, PFN is page file number. It's, essentially, it's the physical address. It's what I was talking about for DAX. One of the interesting ones I came up with just as I was writing these slides, because um, file systems with block size greater than page size. This is something people have been asking for for 10, 15 years now. Lo Keith's shaking his head, longer, 20, 30 years. OK, apparently this has been a problem for a while. And nobody's, nobody's fixed it. So the work that I did with the Radix tree and Kirill has done with the page cache um, gives you the ability to insert um, arbitrary powers of two size pages into the uh, page cache. So not, not just a 4K page, you, you, could put, you could put in an order one page, so 8K or 16K or 32K. So we can support block sizes much, much larger. It's going to be a fairly simple matter of programming at this point to do it, but it, so it's going, to take, it's going to be up to the individual file system authors at this point to go off and allocate larger order pages and then put them in the page cache instead of putting in the, uh, the, 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 the simple order zero. So I, I think this is something that um, interested people should come and talk to me about because I would like to work with some other people on this rather than going off all by myself. And given the number of people who've been asking for this feature um, over the last 30 years, um, I think this is something that you know, and we've always said, no, 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 it's too hard. Well, I've made it easier. Um, so I would like to see, um, see, see, see some collaboration on this. Um, one, of, one of the other enhancements that we're, we're looking at is uh, huge swap entries. So you have these huge page entries in the, in the cache. What do you do 
when these huge page pages reach the end of the inactive list and need to be removed? Well, right now they get decomposed into 4K pages and swapped out individually. That's probably the wrong answer. Uh, in fact, Intel has someone already working on putting a uh, huge swap entry. No, he's not. No. He's decomposing them into 512 entries and putting 512 swap entries in. And I need to persuade him that's a bad idea and he needs to design what a huge swap entry looks like because the, the format of, these, of the swap entry is not, not particularly conducive to um, having a size bit added to it. But we, we, again, simple matter of programming, th th this, this is something we can do. One of the other things I want, I've, I've been interested in uh, for some time is the notion of being able to swap to persistent memory. So have the, the swap code be aware that the swap device is actually on persistent memory. And if the swap device is on persistent memory, not only is it much, much quicker to access than being on a, a standard SSD, but you can still access things that are on persistent memory. So maybe you could just leave it there and put an entry into the page cache that says, go read over there. And so if, if you have this page M mapped, it'll, when, when, you, when you swap it out, you, you would remove the, uh, as you would today, you would remove the entry from the page table. But when you come to swap it back in, you say, well, I've already got it out on the persistent memory. The persistent memory is just about as fast as DRAM. Why don't I just leave it on the swap device and put an entry into the page table that says, no, it's over there. So there's, there's really no swap back in anymore. Things start out in DRAM, but if they happen to reach the end of the inactive list and get paged out, they stay out there. Yeah, I think, I th I think that should work. Um, I just wanted to remind people, in case you weren't looking at my t-shirt, that my employer does now love Linux. <laughs> and um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Cool. Just wondering, with that idea of having, having some swap in persistent memory, uh, I'm wondering if for suitably large machines one might end up with a kind of hierarchical swap where some is in persistent fast memory and some then gets moved to slower SSD or even spinning rust. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's a great point. Um, it, it might well make sense to design a system um, like that. Um, that would be a fair... Oh. I think it's a, re it's a really interesting question to know whether people want to use their computers that way. And it's going to depend on what kind of systems people design, whether we see um, people wanting to add a second swap device that is... Um, that there's out on the SSD or whether people just want to use the RAM and, and it's effectively it's a swapless or, or well, yeah, it's, 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 it's a really interesting question and I think somebody's, somebody's going to try it because there are lots of people trying lots of different things and that's a project I, I'm fairly sure someone will try and it does make sense to try it and we won't know whether it's a good idea until we try it. Thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering how this all fits in still on the side of using persistent memory with long-term storage. I believe that last time I checked, the idea was to put a file system-like area into persistent memory to access that. And there were discussions around there's a cost to, you know, essentially double copy things and those sorts of stuff. How's that actually fitting in around the page cache at the moment? Well, uh, uh, 
at, at the moment, um, as you saw on, on the, uh, the, the, the DAX si slide, um, we, we, we bypass the page cache entirely. Uh, what, what, what I'm hoping that we get to is a, um, is, 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 is a situation where we can intermix um, page cache pages which, um, which, 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 which are backing a, a slower device and um, persistent memory um, entries in, in the page cache which are just giving us the, the physical address. And we, we can tell the difference between the two. Um, so you, 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 you can do that sort of intermixing thing. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on persistent memory because that, 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 that was the talk last year. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Swap seems to be making something of a resurgence in something we're looking at in big systems. And I've had a couple of discussions with people already this week and performance of that subsystem sort of seems it didn't get the, the love that some of the other parts of the storage stack did when we moved to SSDs and now swap on DRAM or DRAM-like is going to be even more critical. So, any thoughts? Kind of? <laughs> I, I was just about to ask what, what was the actual question there. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, we, we, the swap system did not get the loving that uh, other parts did because it was very much seen as a, if you start swapping, then you have already lost. Um, I, th I, th I think that view is never entirely correct, and as you know, with, with SSDs, it's become even less correct. Um, you, you may not have entirely lost if you start swapping. Um, so, yeah, uh, Tim Chen, again at Intel, has been doing some great work on improving the performance of, of the swapper, um, and I expect that work to continue, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that he's uh, making good progress there. What about huge pages that may be hu too huge to realistically write out to swap in reasonable time, say like 16 gigabyte pages? 16 gigabyte pages? Why? You must not be on an Intel architecture. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we, I, I, um, Linus has actually come out fairly strongly in favor of never doing a 16 gigabyte I.O. Um, in fact, I, th I, th I think he said no IOs above four gig. There was there was a discussion recently where somebody, w well, a couple of years ago, where somebody wanted to increase something for increase the size of a type from being, um, you know, an unsigned int limiting you to four gig to an unsigned long, where you could basically have you know a 16 exabyte IO. And he said no, <laughs> because it never makes sense to do a single IO that's more than four gig. So. Uh, the, the current work to put huge pages in the page cache is limited to um, uh, the, 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 the first level up, so the PMD level in, in Linux parlance. Um, there is no work that I'm aware of currently being undertaken to put in a PGD, PGD, P, 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 PUD, right, the, the second level up. So we're, we're not looking at the 16 gigabyte problem yet, or even the one gigabyte problem in Intel, Intel architectures. Um, I think for that size, it probably would make sense to fragment, but that, that might be something that changes over time, and we're, we're going to have to see what the heuristics end up telling us about, is it, is it worth swapping that out, or is it better to split it and swap out part of it? Cool. So forgive me if, if this is a dumb question. When you have pages of vastly different size, how do you decide what to evict? Do you weight the larger pages and evict them first to free up more space? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> and I'm really glad to say I don't have to answer it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a memory management developer by trade. Um, this, this is the closest I've ever got to, to, be, to playing one on TV. Um, the, the, the heuristics I was talking about earlier with the active and inactive list, that, that, those heuristics were all developed by people who have spent a lot more time studying this stuff than I have. And you're absolutely right, it makes no sense whatsoever to weight a, a two megabyte page the same as a four kilobyte page. I don't know whether it makes sense to have separate lists for huge and regular pages, or maybe to give huge pages an extra trip around the inactive list before we kick them out. I think that will be the subject. Once we've got this infrastructure in place, then those guys who, who, who are good at doing that kind of work will be in a position to, to actually do that work and find out what heuristics work best.
We still have the assumption that we're treating anonymous pages and fileback pages differently. Why? Because they are different. Um, they're, they're, they're used in very different ways. Um, the, the cost of swapping out an anonymous page is actually higher than the cost of, of, of just discarding a fileback page and reading that back in. Um, they're, they're used for different purposes. Um, it, it really does make sense to treat them as being completely different things. I mean, you, you do need to balance one against the other. You, you, you can't just, you can't only evict fileback pages and leave all the anonymous pages in. That's not fair. It doesn't, it doesn't lead to best utilization of your hardware, um, or, or, or vice versa for that matter. Um, but it does, it, the, the heuristics work out that it, it, it's better to, tr to consider them separately because they are just, the, the usage patterns are different. Um, so, yeah, keeping the separate is uh, worth doing. Any more questions? Does anyone want me to go through the lockless page cache protocol? This, this, that might cause, uh, I see a couple of hands, it might, this, this might cause people to leave. I will not take offense if you get up and go when I start talking <laughs> about the lockless page cache protocol. Because it's kind of hard. How, how, how many minutes do I have left, by the way? Three? Three? Okay. Three, three minute lockless page cache protocol. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> All right. So, on the left side, this is what the reader does. It finds the page in the radix tree, so it, it, it does a lookup. It, it says, here is an index, find me the, the, the right pointer for it. If it finds that page, it will increment the reference count if it is not zero. If it, does, if it successfully increments the reference count, it will check the page is still in the page cache. And it will do that by looking at the page and saying, does this page still belong to this instance of the page cache? Now, pages during, during this time may have been assigned somewhere else. So <laughs> it, might, it, may, it may have gone to the free list and it may have been reallocated to some completely other purpose. So we have, we have this struct page, the 64-byte entry, which describes what a page does. So that field in the struct page. Now, large uh, bits of the struct page get used for other purposes by other parts of the kernel. They're, they're used for different, if, if you go and look at the definition of struct page, it is a mess of structs and unions that is nested five levels deep. I don't recommend you try and understand it. You just look at it in horror. It, it's, 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 it is Cthulian. Um, but this, we, we, we have successfully so far not reused the reference count for any other purpose that is always the reference count. This is not true of the, uh, the pointer called mapping, which uh, is, is what we check to see that the page is still in the page cache. So if you are the kind of person who says, I want to use, um, I want to reuse an, a, a field in struct page for some other purpose because you, you've allocated the struct page and it's yours now, don't touch those. Don't, don't touch that unless you can be absolutely, don't, don't store a pointer in it, unless you can be sure that that pointer is definitely not a pointer to, <laughs> to uh, the, the, the head of a page cache. So if it's a pointer to something else you own, that's fine, but like, don't stick a user space pointer in there that, that might have a bit pattern that happens to match. You documented that somewhere, right? Yes, this actually is documented. It's crazy. Okay, so what the writer will do the writer will atomically check and zero the reference count. Now, I say check, like check that it's one or check that it's two. There's some expected value that the writer happens to know. So the writer is the person who is perhaps doing truncate. They're, 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 they're trying to remove a page from the page cache. So they will atomically check that the, um, the, the, the value of the reference count is the one they expect it to be. Because if it isn't, that means a reader's got in there and they shouldn't be trying to throw away the page. And if it, if it is what it is, they will atomically zero it. This is an indivisible instruction. You, you cannot get in the middle of it. You might get in first, you might get in second. So, B, they will remove the page from the page cache. And they will set the, the mapping um, pointer to point to somewhere else. I think they actually set it to zero. And then finally, they'll free the page. They will, they will send the page back to the page allocator, and it can then be used for any other purpose whatsoever. Now, if, 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 if you go through and look at all the different possibilities where you know, A, B, 1, 2, C, 3 happen. Somebody's been through this exhaustively. This does work. <laughs> 
I haven't done it myself. I can't. I can't say. There's a lot of different possibilities to consider, and there, there is an extensively argued bit of text inside the kernel somewhere. I think it's in mm/filemap.c, which which explains this in great detail. And I, oh, I've got 40 seconds left. Um, <laughs> um, it it it's. it's I'm really glad that we have people who think about the races between this instruction and the next instruction. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a coward. I like to take spin locks and just say, OK, <laughs> I have a spin lock. I have, I have the only access to this. But sometimes that is just too slow, and you need people who, who think about what, all the races that can happen. And I'm glad I don't have to. <sighs> OK. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Matthew, on behalf of the uh, LCA team, we have a little token of appreciation for all your work. And yes, that's an awesome t-shirt. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lunchtime.